That's nice, but not necessary. Thank you. Uh, let me clarify something just for my own peace of mind. There is a capital C, capital H church historian, which is a calling, and it's occupied by a general authority, Elder Stephen E. Snow, and I am not him. I am a lowercase c, lowercase h, one of many church historians who work in the church history department in Salt Lake City. My sister-in-law says that uh, the, I went to work in the church history department at about the same time that Elder Snow was sustained, and my sister-in-law knew that I was going to work there. And so in the next general conference, when Elder Snow was sustained, they said it is proposed that we sustain as the church historian Elder Stephen, and she was assuming that they were going to say my name, so they didn't, <laughs> and I'm not the church historian, and I just uh, feel, I don't know why, but I feel like I have to uh, clarify that. Everybody clear on that? <laughs> okay, good. One of many people who work in the church historians, uh, church history department. I am thrilled to be here tonight to talk about the period of time between when Joseph Smith learned from Moroni that there were, um, well, there was a book deposited written upon gold plates and the time he actually got those plates into his possession. So that's what we'll be talking about, telling the story of tonight. Millennia before Joseph Smith reached his teen years in rural New York, the God of Israel revealed that he would raise a choice seer from among the descendants of Joseph of Egypt, a namesake, and command him and give him power to bring forth my word. Joseph Smith was born a seer. This is the story of his becoming the Lord's chosen seer. There is a difference. President Brigham Young taught that there are thousands in the world who are natural born seers. But when the Lord selected Joseph Smith to be his mouthpiece upon the earth in this dispensation, he saw that he would be faithful and honor his calling. So to put it another way, this is the story of Joseph Smith choosing to rise to his calling, to bring forth the Lord's word, the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith's 1838-39 history says that after his vision in the spring of 1820, he continued to pursue his common vocation meaning that he farmed with his father and took odd jobs to supplement the family income. Joseph's histories do not include detailed descriptions of his lesser known activities, but they are candid about his teenage struggles, sins, and his efforts to overcome them. For instance, an early draft of his manuscript history reads, during the space of time which intervened between the time I had the vision and the year 1823, Having been forbidden to join any of the religious sects of the day and being of very tender years and persecuted by those who ought to have been my friends and to have treated me kindly, and if they supposed me to have been deluded, to have endeavored in a proper and affectionate manner to have reclaimed me, I was left to all kinds of temptations. And mingling with all kinds of society, I frequently fell into many foolish errors and displayed the weakness of youth and the corruption of human nature which I am sorry to say led me into diverse temptations to the gratification of many appetites offensive in the sight of God. A few years later, while preparing Joseph's history for publication, Willard Richards revised this statement, perhaps at Joseph's request. Willard softened Joseph's confession by deleting some words and by adding these ones. In making this confession, no one need suppose me guilty of any great or malignant sins. A disposition to commit such was never in my nature. But I was guilty of levity, and sometimes associated with jovial company, etc., not consistent with that character which ought to be maintained by one who was called of God as I had been. There's no evidence in the historical record that Joseph was guilty of sins that unalterably shaped his destiny, but evidence indicates that he was troubled by a nagging covetousness, complicated by his family's being often on the verge of, but never finally attaining a comfortable living. God had work for Joseph Smith to do, and Satan determined to thwart it. Historical documents, especially Joseph's autobiographies, but also his mother's memoir, Oliver Cowdery's historical letters, and Joseph Knight's autobiography, 
Enable us to watch Joseph struggle to choose between God's plan for him and Satan's efforts to undermine the Book of Mormon translation. These records make it possible to observe how God sent a messenger to tutor, chasten, and empower Joseph, finally enabling the tempted, unlearned farmer to begin a most marvelous work and a wonder, the translation and publication of the Book of Mormon. Considering Joseph attempted, even at times a foolish teenager, may seem antithetical to the justified praises we sing to the man who communed with Jehovah, but this is the story of how he became. So it must begin with what he candidly confessed about where he began. Aside from his confession above, he wrote in 1832 that many days after his first vision in 1820, I fell into transgressions and sinned in many things, which brought a wound upon my soul. He said further that when I was 17 years of age, I called again upon the Lord, and he showed unto me a heavenly vision. For behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before me, and it was by night. And he called me by name, and he said the Lord had forgiven me my sins. Joseph's weakness, coupled with his faith in Jesus Christ, humility, and resulting repentance, including his choice to respond positively to chastisement, suggests why he was not just a seer, but the one God chose to bring forth the Book of Mormon. Joseph wasn't immune to sin and error, nor did he entirely escape their effects. Rather, relying on the Lord and responding faithfully to his instructions, he overcame them to bring forth a marvelous work indeed. Joseph knelt at his bedside on September 21st, 1823, to seek forgiveness for having succumbed to temptations. Knowing about his activities in these years makes Joseph's repentance and his experiences with Moroni and the Book of Mormon plates more meaningful. Joseph Smith's America included a substantial group of settlers who shared what one historian called an unconquerable expectation of finding buried treasure in the earth. There's evidence that both Joseph and his father joined in some of the activities of a group of neighborhood treasure seekers who looked for buried riches in nocturnal rituals. This seemingly strange preoccupation was not so strange in that time and place. Joseph's world was rapidly shifting from an agrarian economy to an industrialized and capitalistic marketplace. And for many, that meant opportunity and wealth. But for many others, including the Smith family, it meant one setback after another. Like the markets, churches were becoming more free and open, competing for converts the same way that shoemakers or whiskey distillers were increasingly competing for consumers. Many people, including Joseph Smith, struggled with the twin developments of market revolution and the multiplication of churches from which to choose. His family experienced these developments as pressure an escalation of stress and anxiety about their home economy and their eternal salvation. Joseph Smith's family could neither capitalize on an opportunity to get ahead financially, nor settle on which church to join. For them and many others, treasure seeking made good sense. Though most so-called respectable folks, the ones Joseph mentioned in his history, the ones he thought ought to have befriended him if they were good Christians, they thought treasure seeking was beneath them. Historian Alan Taylor observed that treasure seeking met the needs of some people who felt pressured by the culture's demand that they get more possessions and more religion. Treasure seeking, in other words, promised both quick wealth and a sense of power over the supernatural world. Treasure seekers in Joseph's neighborhood and elsewhere were sure that pirates or explorers had left mines or buried riches or that the numerous burial mounds made by ancient American civilizations were repositories of wealth. Many treasure seekers were sure that guardian spirits kept the treasures from being easily found, and they thought that the phase of the moon affected their chances of success at finding and recovering buried treasures. Dreams were sometimes thought to lead them to their goal, and in the early 19th century, treasure seekers turned increasingly to seer stones or peep stones, as they sometimes called them, to reveal the location of buried treasures. Well, Joseph evidently discovered one or more of these stones after his first vision and before he knelt to pray for forgiveness in September 1823. Though made by people antagonistic to Joseph, there's no reason to reject the basic assertion that he searched for buried treasure using a marvelous stone. He did not dispute that fact, 
and people who loved him and trusted him and followed him confirmed that he had such a stone. A man who hired Joseph said that Joseph first saw in a stone that belonged to a neighbor girl, and that stone led him to the discovery of his own. A neighbor said that Joseph could see in a stone they found while digging a well. His mother also acknowledged it, saying that Joseph, quote, was in possession of certain means by which he could discern things that could not be seen by the natural eye. Joseph Knight, who employed Joseph in 1826 and who converted shortly after the church was organized, wrote that Joseph looked in his glass, meaning his stone. Brigham Young later used the term seer stone to describe this object, Lucy's means and Joseph Knight's glass. Some people are suspicious about the idea of seeing or discerning with a stone or stones or other material objects endowed with supernatural power, but that suspicion has developed relatively recently. People don't realize that's as much an indicator of the culture and time in which they live as it is any sort of objective reality that's always been so. It's nothing really more than a skeptical assumption made by our culture. It's not a proven fact shared by many cultures, and it has not always been the dominant idea that it is today in our unbelieving time and place. As the Bible attests, in ancient Israel, certain stones were associated with the priestly or prophetic office and were considered a means of revelation. The Bible says that Jacob, Moses, and Aaron had powerful rods and that Joseph of Egypt had a cup whereby indeed he divineth. In the Book of Mormon, Alma taught his son Helaman a prophecy from the Lord in which the Lord said, I will prepare unto my servant Gazalem a stone which shall shine forth in darkness unto light. And the Lord prepared two stones for Jared's brother. We all know that he prepared 16 to light the barges. But if you read on just a bit, you read that the Lord prepared two stones to bury with his records that could be used to translate. In Renaissance and early modern Europe, there were several magician mathematicians, including Isaac Newton, who sought after or used marvelous stones. John Dee, for example, taught algebra and navigation. He sought to commune with angels and he used a translucent stone that has been on display in the British Museum. The most important point here is not the revelatory object or what the scriptures repeatedly call the means. The point of emphasis here is the gift of revelation itself. Joseph had the gift as described in this Book of Mormon passage. A seer is a revelator and a prophet also and a gift which is greater can no man have. A seer can know of things which are past and also of things which are to come, and by them shall all things be revealed, or rather, secret things be made manifest, and hidden things shall come to light, and things which are not known shall be made known by them, and also things shall be made known by them which otherwise could not be known. Thus God has provided a means that man, through faith, might work mighty miracles, Therefore, he becometh a great benefit to his fellow beings. As a teenager, Joseph was an undeveloped seer in the process of becoming the Lord's chosen seer, the process of learning how to apply the gift of revelation. On September 21st, 1823, Joseph went to bed, but not to sleep. I was very conscious, he later said of that night, that I had not kept the commandments, and I repented heartily for all my sins and transgressions and humbled myself. Then light flooded the room, making it brighter than at midday, and an angel appeared, striking, luminous, and standing in the air. Joseph shrank in fear for a moment before the messenger spoke his name, introduced himself as Moroni, and announced that God had work for Joseph to do. He told me of a sacred record, which was written on plates of gold, Joseph remembered adding, I saw in vision the place where they were deposited. It was the sacred history of a lost civilization, Christians that the Savior had visited, Moroni said, and with it were two stones, means that God had prepared for its translation. Whoever had the stones and could see in them was a seer, Moroni told Joseph, to whom the news was both fascinating and somewhat familiar, for as we have seen, Joseph had already seen in stones. He had the gift of which Moroni spoke, and the Lord had sent him a mentor to help him rise to the gift's innate potential to perform a marvelous work. Moroni launched his first lesson. 
Ancient American Christians, including himself, had inscribed their sacred history on golden plates, which were now concealed in a nearby hill with seer stones prepared for translating them. Then Moroni commenced quoting the prophecies of the Old Testament, first from Malachi, who described the, the coming day that shall burn as an oven, and the wicked shall be left without ancestry or posterity, burned as stubble and eternally alone. And then Moroni made Malachi's distant prophecy proximate. I will reveal unto you, Joseph, the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant the, in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers. And the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Well, how much Joseph understood that night is not clear, but over time he learned that Moroni meant that God had chosen him to restore the powerful priesthood ordinances in which solemn covenants could bind families to God, and by leading them to eternal lives, fulfill the plan of redemption which this earth was created to facilitate. Otherwise, all the effort and energy put forth in creating this earth would be wasted at the Lord's coming. That was heavy-duty stuff for a 17-year-old, and there was more. Moroni quoted from Isaiah chapter 11, which foretells that Christ will come in glory, might, and vengeance to separate the righteous from the wicked, but not before setting his hand again the second time and gathering the outcasts of Israel by setting up an ensign for the nations, a standard, or in other words, a church, with a commission to preach the gospel to the whole world. Moroni then quoted Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, prophesying that all who failed to hear the Lord's warning voice and gather to his ensign would be destroyed. He then cited Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, saying, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Moreover, cataclysms and terrible judgments would be visited upon all who failed to build Zion. And in the end, Moroni taught, Zion builders alone would be delivered. Moroni told Joseph that the fullness of the Gentiles was soon to come in, meaning that the large-scale spread of the gospel to all nations loomed imminently in the future. And then, Joseph said, he quoted many other passages of scripture and offered many explanations which cannot be mentioned here. Moroni seemed concerned that Joseph might succumb to his temptations and ruin all that the prophets had done to prepare the Book of Mormon for Latter-day readers. Writing while he was still a mortal to a young Joseph, chosen to translate the sacred records and potentially covetous of the wealth embedded in a stack of precious metal, Moroni said, the plates are of no worth because of the commandment of the Lord. For he truly saith that no one shall have them to get gain, but the record thereof is of great worth. And whoso shall bring it to light, him will the Lord bless. Now, standing midair in Joseph's room, Moroni explained that Joseph could not have the plates or the seer stones then, and he warned that if he showed them to others without permission, he would be destroyed. Joseph envisioned the hillside on which Moroni had himself deposited the plates over a millennium earlier, and then the light gathered around the messenger, and he ascended through a conduit right up into heaven, leaving Joseph in a dark, still room, marveling greatly at what had been told to me by this extraordinary messenger, as he said. I lay musing on the singularity of the scene, Joseph remembered, when in the midst of my meditation, Moroni reappeared. He again related the very same message and then added more detail on the great judgments which were coming upon the earth before ascending again. Sleep had fled from my eyes, Joseph wrote, and I lay overwhelmed in astonishment at what I had both seen and heard. And then Moroni appeared a third time, relayed the same message, and cautioned Joseph that Satan would try to tempt me in consequence of the indigent circumstances of my father's family, to get the plates for the purpose of getting rich. This he forbade me, saying that I must have no other object in view in getting the plates but to glorify God, and must not be influenced by any other motive but that of building his kingdom. Otherwise, I could not get them. Joseph's mother said that Moroni added a few words of caution and instruction, thus, that he must beware of covetousness, and he must not suppose that the record was to be brought forth with the view of getting gain, for this was not the case, but that it was to bring forth light and intelligence which had for a long time been lost to the world, and that when he went to get the plates, he must be on his guard or his mind would be filled with darkness. Moroni stated in certain terms that Joseph might choose to succumb to temptation, 
but then he would not be chosen to receive the plates. As one scholar summarized Joseph's situation, he was neither to exhibit the plates to anyone, nor think of alleviating his family's impoverishment by selling them. So seeking fame and fortune, two of the most potent temptations, were explicitly and absolutely forbidden by God's messenger. Warned against the temptations he would face, Joseph had to choose. When Moroni ascended again, Joseph was left to ponder on the strangeness of what I had just experienced, but was interrupted by a rooster announcing that day was approaching. Joseph arose and went to work as usual. He, his brother Alvin, and their father began harvesting together, but Joseph seemed preoccupied. Joseph, Alvin said, we must keep to work or we shall not get our task done. Joseph tried to get back to work, but when his father saw how weak he was, he sent him home. I started with the intention of going to the house, Joseph later wrote, but in attempting to cross the fence out of the field where we were, my strength entirely failed me, and I fell helpless on the ground, unconscious. Awaking, Joseph saw the messenger whom he had seen the night before. According to Joseph's mother, Moroni told Joseph the night before to tell his father what he had seen and heard, but Joseph had not. Why? the angel asked him. I was afraid my father would not believe me, Joseph replied. He will believe every word you say to him, Moroni promised. I obeyed, Joseph wrote tellingly. I rehearsed the whole matter to him. He replied to me that it was of God and told me to go and do as commanded by the messenger. Joseph reported to the hill that we call Cumorah because of the Book of Mormon, but which the Smiths knew simply as a hill of considerable size. There, near the top, on the west side, Joseph found the stone which concealed the box in which the plates were deposited. I obtained a lever, Joseph wrote, which I got fixed under the edge of the stone, and with a little exertion raised it up. I looked in, and there indeed did I behold the plates, the Urim and Thummim, and the breastplate, as stated by the messenger. Here, Joseph's history, as we have it in the Pearl of Great Price, is terse. It says just, I made an attempt to take them out, but was forbidden by the messenger. But other evidence shows that, warnings notwithstanding, Joseph entertained the predictable temptations he received. Oliver Cowdery wrote in 1835 that Joseph ex had experienced the visions of heaven during the night, and also seeing and hearing in open day, but the mind of man is easily turned if it is not held by the power of God through the prayer of faith. And as Joseph walked to the hill, two invisible powers were operating on his mind, one urging the certainty of wealth and ease in this life so powerfully wrought upon him by the time he arrived that the angel's instructions had entirely gone from his recollection. Oliver didn't blame Joseph. He said he was young and his mind easily turned from correct principles, but also, Oliver acknowledged, he was teachable and ready to be led to the great work of God and be qualified to perform it in due time. According to Oliver, Joseph had heard of the powers of enchantment and a thousand like stories which held the treasures of the earth. And he supposed that physical exertion and personal strength was only necessary to enable him to yet obtain the object of his wish. So on attempting to take possession of the record, a shock was produced upon his system by an invisible power which deprived him in a measure of his natural strength. Agonizing that he was powerless to take the plates, Joseph cried out to the Lord, Why can I not obtain them? You have not kept the commandments of the Lord which I gave unto you, came the angel's reply. He explained to Joseph how succumbing to temptation could teach him what Moroni called the power of the adversary and commanded Joseph to repent, and he promised the Lord's forgiveness if he would. Joseph remembered what he had been taught, and he began to pray, and the Spirit returned. Joseph was teachable. And according to his mother, Moroni said to Joseph, Now I will show you the difference between light and darkness, and the operation of a good spirit and an evil one. An evil spirit will try to crowd your mind with every evil and wicked thing, to keep every good thought and feeling out of your mind. But you must keep your mind always stayed upon God, that no evil may come into your heart. According to Oliver, Moroni showed Joseph a vision of the prince of darkness, surrounded by his innumerable train of associates, and he taught Joseph, all this is shown, the good and the evil, the holy and the impure, the glory of God and the power of darkness, that you may know hereafter the two powers and never be influenced or overcome by that wicked one. So Joseph returned home from the hill empty-handed but full of knowledge. He admitted in his 1832 autobiography, I had been tempted of the adversary and sought the plates to obtain riches 
and kept not the commandment that I should have an eye single to the glory of God. Therefore, I was chastened. According to Lucy, the angel told Joseph that he could not take them from the place wherein they were deposited until he had learned to keep the commandments of God, clarifying that Joseph needed to become not only willing, but able to do it. In his later history, Joseph rendered the story more matter-of-factly. He said there simply that he learned on that first visit to the hill that the time for bringing them forth had not yet arrived, neither would it until four years from that time. But he told me that I should come to that place precisely in one year from that time, and he would there meet with me, and that I should continue to do so until the time should come for obtaining the plates. Accordingly, as I had been commanded, I went at the end of each year, and at each time I found the same messenger there and received instruction and intelligence from him uh, at each of our interviews, respecting what the Lord was going to do and how and in what manner his kingdom was to be conducted in the last days. Readers of this passage in Joseph's history often assume that he knew at the time that it would be four years before he received the plates, but he did not. He knew that in retrospect, as he said in his history. That's actually what it says if you read it carefully, but it's not how it's read most often. All he knew at the time was that the time was not yet and that he should return in exactly one year and continue faithful until the unspecified time came. Joseph was not simply to pass the time until he got the plates, regardless of his behavior. He was to prove himself faithful to the Lord's instructions and get the plates because of his obedience. Joseph was to improve the time by gaining experience in keeping the commandments of God and gaining strength to resist the temptations. Joseph's four-year probation was characterized not only by divine visitations and adversarial interferences, but also by the vicissitudes of everyday family responsibilities as he sought to make ends meet at home and later with his bride, Emma Hale. Throughout these years, God, largely through the angel Moroni, mentored Joseph to fulfill his potential as the seer who would obtain and protect the buried golden plates, translate them through the gift of God, and ultimately shepherd the sacred writings into print. Joseph farmed and helped his brother Alvin build a respectable middle-class frame home for their aging parents. After a day's work, Joseph's family gathered, all seated in a circle, listening in breathless anxiety, his mother said, to the religious teachings of a boy 18 years of age. He urged them not to tell others, fearing rejection and even violence against him. Covetous neighbors, Treasure seekers might get word and demand the treasure. The Smith family members were to hold sacred that which Moroni had revealed in order to show themselves trustworthy of obtaining further knowledge. If we are wise and prudent in that which is revealed to us, Joseph taught them, God is able to make all things known to us. His father agreed and promised that they would try to live worthily to be so trusted by God. On the 15th of November, 1823, Lucy remembered, Alvin was taken very sick. The family doctor was summoned, but unavailable. Another doctor came and administered a heavy dose of calomel to the patient, although he objected much against it, his mother said, and soon recognized that he wouldn't survive. He charged Hiram to finish the frame home and to take care of his parents in their old age. He spoke to each of his siblings in turn, telling Joseph, now nearly 18, I'm going to die now. The distress which I suffer and the sensations that I have tell me my time is very short. Be a good boy. Do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record. Be faithful in receiving instruction, keeping every commandment that is given to you. Alvin bade an affectionate farewell to two-year-old Lucy and then died. By the following spring, 1824, after a long morning, family routines had returned pretty much to normal. A new preacher had come to town and taught the need for the different denominations to agree and Worship God with one mind and one heart. And Lucy wished to join them and tried to persuade my husband to do so, she said. Joseph Sr. attended a few times, and the children, except Joseph. He assured Lucy that he could take his Bible and go out into the woods and learn more in two hours than you could if you were to go to meeting for two years. Joseph was growing confidently into his calling. He told his mother that it would not hurt her to join, but he prophesied that Though the fellow she wanted to listen to preached piously, within one year he would take the last cow of a widowed mother to satisfy a meager debt. Lucy 
had long since perceived that her son had a gift, and she was even more impressed when the preacher fulfilled the young seer's prophecy. Such religion did not satisfy Joseph. Many came preaching various doctrines, but he remained apart, awaiting more instructions from a messenger sent from the presence of God. According to Lucy Moroni, I told Joseph he could obtain the plates on September 22nd, 1824, if he would keep them in his hands, take them straight home, and secure them there in a trunk with a good lock and key. The whole family, most of all Joseph, anxiously anticipated that he would return home with them. He went to the hill on the appointed day, peeled back the mossy grass, pried up the stone that covered them, and looked down on the plates. He reached down and lifted them from their stone box, when, according to his mother, the thought flashed across his mind that there might be something more in the box, something he could profit from after all. Excited, Joseph laid the plates down to cover the box, planning to come back later for the rest. And when he turned back to pick up the plates, they were gone. But where, he knew not, nor how, nor did he know by what means they had been taken away, his mother said. Alarmed, he knelt and prayed. The angel appeared and told him that he had not done as he was commanded, and that he was still tempted with the view of securing some fancied or imaginary treasure, that he was still too easily overcome by the powers of darkness not yet vigilant enough, not motivated solely by the glory of God. After the rebuke, Moroni allowed Joseph to raise the stone again and see that the plates were safe in the box. Joseph reached for them again, but was hurled back. The angel left, and Joseph rose and returned to the house, weeping, disappointed, and fearing that his family would no longer believe him. He was no sooner in the door than his father asked whether he had obtained the plates. No, father, he said, I could not get them. Did you see them, his father asked. Yes, Joseph replied, I saw them, but I couldn't take them. Well, I would have taken them, his father said earnestly, if I had been in your place. Subdued, Joseph said, you do not know what you say. I could not get them. The angel of the Lord would not let me. Joseph then related the whole story, causing his parents to fear that he may never qualify to get the plates. We, therefore, Lucy remembered, doubled our diligence in prayer and supplication to God in order that he might be more fully instructed in his duty and preserved from all the wiles and machinations of him who lieth in wait to deceive. So Joseph's 1824 attempt to obtain the plates was yet another learning opportunity that, though emotionally painful, helped train him into a steward of the Book of Mormon plates and into a seer who could translate the sacred writings inscribed on them. There are no detailed records of what happened in the next year, September of 1825, there is evidence, though, that the temptation for Joseph to use his gift for material gain intensified rather than diminished. With Alvin's death, the burden of finishing the frame home and meeting the annual mortgage payment fell increasingly to Hiram, and when Hiram married, to Joseph. They scoured the countryside for odd jobs, and in October of 1825, a fellow named Josiah Stoll, a farmer from southeastern New York, enticed Joseph and his father to come and work for him. Stoll had, according to Joseph, heard something of a silver mine having been opened by Spaniards in Harmony, Susquehanna County, state of Pennsylvania, and had previous to my hiring with him been digging in order to discover, if possible, the mine. Stoll had also heard of Joseph's gift. He had learned, as Lucy put it, that Joseph was in possession of certain means by which he could discern things that could not be seen by the natural eye. So Stoll had come nearly 120 miles to offer Joseph high wages for such skill, appealing to the struggling Smith family, as you might expect. So now Joseph faced a real dilemma. Should he sell his reputation as a seer for $14 a month to help his family make the mortgage payment on the farm they had worked awfully hard to improve? It seemed like a harmless decision, and Joseph decided to follow Stoll to Susquehanna County. But in the winter of 1826, Stoll's nephew filed a complaint against Joseph with the Justice of the Peace in South Bainbridge, New York. Joseph was evidently arrested and tried for disorderly conduct that almost certainly stemmed from using his stone to search for buried treasure. One account of the trial reports that the Smiths were mortified that the wonderful power which God had so miraculously given should be used in search of filthy lucre. The search, the digging stopped after a month. And Joseph Sr. returned home while Joseph Jr. stayed to work with the Knight family for the Knight family of Colesville, New York. According to Joseph Knight Jr., Joseph told the Knights that he had seen a vision, that a personage had appeared to him and told him where there was a book of ancient date buried. They believed and encouraged Joseph. 
While digging for Stoll, Joseph boarded with the family of Isaac Hale in Harmony, where he met their tall, dark-haired daughter, Emma. Encouraged by his parents, Josiah Stoll, and the Knights, Joseph courted Emma and sought her hand in marriage, but her father objected. On January 18, 1827, strong-willed, 22-year-old Emma married Joseph Smith in South Bainbridge, New York, in a simple ceremony by a justice of the peace, which always reminds me, I, a student once asked me, in what temple were Joseph and Emma Smith married? <laughs> they were married in a house that still stands by a justice of the peace, later sealed by the power of the holy priesthood in 1843. They went, after they were married, directly to Manchester, New York, where they lived with Joseph's parents. Just as Lucy finished getting the new house ready for their arrival, and while she was thanking the Lord for the prospect of a quiet and comfortable old age, their contractor came to the door to tell her that he had agreed with the mortgage agent to purchase the home and farm. Friends circulated a petition protesting the sale. Finally, the Smiths persuaded Lemuel Durfee, a prosperous Quaker that they knew, to let them to buy the place and then let them continue there. We were now renters, Lucy remembered, deeply discouraged. Once more, their fortunes had failed. Soon after this, Lucy wrote, Joseph went to town on an errand for his father. Lucy remembered that he did not return home until the night was considerably advanced, and she worried because she was aware that God intended him for a good and important work. Consequently, she said, we expected that the powers of darkness would strive against him more than against others. Joseph, why have you stayed so late, his father asked when he finally arrived home and threw himself into a chair. Father, he answered after a while, I have had the severest chastisement that I ever had in my life. Joseph's father wanted to know who presumed to find fault with his son. Father, Joseph said, it was the angel of the Lord. He says that I've been negligent and that the time has now come when the record must be brought forth and I must be up and doing, that I must set myself about the things which God has commanded me to do. But Father, give yourself no uneasiness about this reprimand, for I know what course I am to pursue, and all will be well. That summer, Emma wrote home to her parents, asking permission to retrieve her clothes and some cows and furniture that her father uh, had given to her. He agreed that she could have them, and Joseph set out with a neighbor for Harmony, Pennsylvania to get them. Through tears, Isaac Hale accused Joseph of stealing his daughter and pled with him to bring her back and promised to help Joseph get a start in farming if he would. Evidently, Joseph wept too, and he promised to stop using his gift for money and to move to harmony with Emma. But even as Joseph rolled along toward his parents' home again in the wagon, he knew it would be very hard. They will all oppose me, he said to his neighbor who had gone with him. He said that about the others in the neighborhood who, who wanted him to seek for buried treasure. They want me to look in the stone for them, he said, to dig for money. This neighbor testified that what it was in fact as he predicted. They urged him day after day to resume his old practice of looking in the stone. He seemed as much perplexed, much perplexed about the course he should pursue. In that dilemma, Joseph received an ultimatum from Moroni. According to Joseph Knight, during Joseph's September 1826 meeting with the angel, he learned that if he would do right according to the will of God, he might obtain the plates the 22nd day of September next, and if not, he never would have them. As the time drew near, Joseph Knight and Josiah Stoll made an ostensible business trip upstate in order to be in Manchester on September 22nd, 1827. They knew exactly what day that was, and they wanted to be there to see what would happen. Joseph asked his mother if she had a chest with a lock and a key. Suspecting his purposes, she fretted that she didn't have one. Joseph assured her everything would be all right, but Lucy remained sleepless through the night, remembering what she called the first failure to return with the plates. Emma appeared in the late evening downstairs in her riding dress and bonnet, and she and Joseph left in Joseph Knight's wagon. That night, Moroni entrusted the plates to Joseph, now age 21. The next morning, Lucy made breakfast and excused Joseph, who had not yet returned home, when his father requested his company, and Joseph Knight thought that his wagon had been stolen. When Joseph finally arrived, he assured his mother that all was well, but he couldn't resist the chance to prolong the anxiety in others. I'll just add parenthetically here, if you don't know this story, it's really great. It's in Joseph's mother's memoir. 
and she's been stressed all night long. And he comes back to the house with nothing, at least no stack of gold plates that she can discern. And she says that she goes to the back of the house, just a wreck, and he chases after her and calms her anxieties and says, Mom, everything's okay. Look, I've got a key. And then he, she says that he puts into her hands a cloth, some, something wrapped in a cloth, and that she feels it, and there are two triangular-shaped, sort of triangular-shaped stones in a, in a bow, in a metal bow. Of course, that's what we call the Urim and Thummim. So he let her hold that wrapped up, and that seemed to put her at ease. And the most interesting thing to me about this part of the story is how much Joseph seems relieved. He's back to his native cheery temperament. He has been stressed out for four years, as you might expect. And now all of a sudden, he's back to his, um, his dominant personality. Here's the evidence. He eats breakfast with his father and their guests. And then he calls Joseph Knight aside into a, a separate room. And Joseph sets his foot on the bed and puts his head in his hands as if he's de depressed or disappointed. And he says... I am so disappointed. And Joseph Knight, knowing what's at stake, tries to reassure him. I'm sorry, he says. Oh, I'm greatly disappointed, Joseph says, and goes on and on. And then he just bursts out and says, it is ten times better than I expected. <laughs> I can see anything. They are marvelous, he says, speaking of the stones that he, that he got from Moroni. So that was uh, a glimpse into what it was like in the house that day. High stress. And then enormous relief for Joseph to finally be entrusted with the plates. So finally, Joseph had obtained the plates and with them some relief from the struggle that that goal required. Joseph Smith's teenage journey from 1823 to 1827, from a natural born seer, as, Joseph, as Brigham Young put it, to the Lord's chosen seer, was marked by uh, the trials of helping provide for his family financially. Also, the temptations and subsequent reproof and repentance rooted in the Lord's efforts to train him into the seer chosen to bring forth his word and the adversary's attempt to upset that trajectory. Joseph learned humility, penitence, and persistence from his temptations and trials. Moroni chastened him several times, and he responded by striving to repent and improve and become what God knew he could be. He was faced with intense financial pressure within his families, both the family he grew up in and his own marriage with Emma. And that created in him a natural desire to provide in the best possible way. Yet he learned to control his passions and desires and not set his heart on riches. Joseph's teenage years show him struggling, choosing, and becoming what he was called to be, all in the context of his assignment to bring forth the Book of Mormon. So it's my belief that there's no need to avoid or obfuscate or apologize for Joseph's confessed sins, his foibles and his foolish errors, as he called them, because a nurturing God fashioned them into learning experiences that helped Joseph see, as his mother put it in Moroni's, quoting Moroni, the difference between light and darkness and the operation of a good spirit and an evil one. So as the summer of 1827 ended, Joseph Smith, still far from perfect, had qualified himself to obtain the sacred plates. He had had, in four years, chosen this day whom he would serve. He had faced dilemmas, been sorely tempted, rebuked by an angel, and now at last reached a turning point in his life as the Lord's seer. Elder Dallin H. Oaks noted all this evidence in a talk he gave on this campus years ago, and he described this process that we've talked about here tonight. He said that no prophet is free from human frailty, especially before he is called to devote his life to the Lord's work. Line upon line, young Joseph Smith expanded his faith and understanding, and his spiritual gifts matured until he stood with power and stature as the prophet of the restoration. That's my testimony as well, and I say it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.